I want to talk about the fact that um, many of us have argued for a very, very long time, and in fact wrote it in the Vintuk Declaration, that uh, a free and independent African press was absolutely essential for maintenance and development of democracy as well as economic development of any country. But we've never had evidence that that is actually so. We have never truly had demonstrable evidence that that is so. And in the world and history of media development, the donors have frequently and possibly with some reason chosen not to support development of a free and independent media as such, but often rather to develop uh, to support what we call communication or media for development, which is not wrong, but it has limitations. And so often, although very little money is made available by donors, generally speaking, for development of the media issues, the vast majority of that little amount of money has usually gone for um, issues about um, propagating messages about health, for instance, through the media, gender, equi gender equity, all kinds of other sort of development issues, but not building a free and independent media as such, as a value in itself, as an objective in itself. Not making a budget that actually says, here is an area, it's called media development, here we will help free and independent media develop in the world because it will directly contribute to development without us having to always support all these other communication for development areas. So, last year, in about January 2012, suddenly the first hard research that started proving this case was actually produced. And it was produced, it was a two-year study that was published eventually in 2012. And the study was published and undertaken by the World Bank and uh, an American media development organization called Internews, and it was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And really what gives it its clout is that it is based on substantial econometric and statistical data for the first time, which shows a strong connection between a free press and economic development and democracy around the world. A snapshot of some of the major findings um, of the study are that broad-based economic growth and political stability in Africa seem strongly connected to the presence of a free press. Over the last decade, foreign aid as a percentage of GDP has been significantly lower in African countries with a free press than in countries without a free press. In free press countries, the literacy rate is higher than in countries without a free press, and the literacy rate for free press countries has grown significantly over the last decade. Free press countries do notably better in the area of political stability and the absence of violence. Countries in Africa with a free press show significantly higher democratic accountability than countries without a free press. African free press countries are much more conducive to business than countries without a free press. Entrepreneurship is less financially risky both at startup and at close down. The cost of starting a business is significantly less and they participate much more in international business than countries without a free press. Much of this is likely, at least in part, to the fact that a free press can reveal detrimental government interference in business and because free flows of information about business and business regulation support a strong market economy. Human development indicators are still admittedly very poor when looking at sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, but the report says, and I quote, there is clear evidence that a free press, better development and better governance are all linked, and that in many ways, press freedom supports development. Now, the name of this particular um, report is Media Map, Healthy Media, Vibrant Societies, How Strengthening the Media Can Boost Development in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the statistical and quantitative studies, particularly conducted by the World Bank, by analyzing evidence that they've had over many years, that they've just reconfigured in many ways, and that they've, let's say, put on top of statistics about which countries in Africa have a freer press than others, and then looking at economic data with the free press countries over them, and suddenly seeing these trends emerge. That's sort of essentially what they really did. Um, this is also available online, and in my written paper, I actually do give the, the internet references where um, a lot of this can be read, and I, I think the paper will go onto the website of the GFMD. Other things.
things that I would simply like to add to what I think is really, really important and, and, and groundbreaking um, research is that the report also gives advice, if you like, to donors about things which they shouldn't, rather shouldn't do. Some of the advice includes letting donor political considerations drive where aid goes. African countries have not taken ownership of the process of media development. And remember, now we're talking about the development of an independent media, which includes, for instance, development of better media law and policy, media regulation for free media systems rather than closed systems, looking at the sustainable business environment um, for media and, and, and so on. That, well, that these issues are of, of, of pretty fundamental um, importance and as much aid must go into those areas, if not more, than the traditional communication for development sectors like health and all those other important development issues. Not arguing that money shouldn't go there, by the way, just that all the money shouldn't go there and quite a lot of it should go the way of supporting um, independent development. Particularly, the business environment for independent media has got to be supported far, far more proactively and strongly in Africa. It's beginning to happen in the area of of ICTs and new media development and so on, and I'm going to leave it to a much more experienced colleague to talk about that particular area, but there's quite dramatic um, things happening in Africa in that regard. But in terms of even looking at traditional media, what we sometimes call legacy media, which is very important in Africa, radio is the dominant media. I think 61% of Africans actually still listen to the radio on a daily basis. 8% read newspapers, but that number has got to grow. Only about a third of Africans watch television on a more or less um, regular basis. But radio is still being this, this, this absolutely dominant media. You've got to look at the business models of what can also sustain this kind of media. One of the big problems in Africa with radio, for instance, is that although tens of millions of Africans listen to the radio every single day of their lives, they are listening to the state broadcasters in Africa who have the reach and the infrastructure um, to put up transmitters all over the countries, to broadcast in the indigenous languages, and so forth. However, these are not independent broadcasters or independent public broadcasters, as we believe they should be. They certainly are firmly state-controlled broadcasters that control political thinking, access to information, and so forth. And it is actually terribly important in terms of democratic reform that these broad the attempts must continue to transform these broadcasters into what we call independent um, public broadcasters that may be funded by governments but broadcast in the public interest. Lots of people say that's pie in the sky. It's not, <laughs> it's not ever going to happen, but I think we must remember that there would have been times in Europe where the state broadcasters might have been very, very much the same. And over periods of time and with democratic growth in the country, your broadcasters also changed, and I think we should continue fighting for this kind of a deal in Africa. Um, Last issue that I, I want to raise is that, um, as some of you may know, Africa Rising was the dramatic cover page headline of the December 2011 edition of The Economist magazine, the British Economist magazine. This was in stark contrast to its headline a decade earlier when it described Africa as the hopeless continent. The African Development Bank says that Africa's economy is growing faster than any other continent and that over one third of its countries are experiencing GDP growth rates of over 6%. Taking stock of the role of the African media over the past 50 years, a colleague of mine, Professor Kwame Karekari of Ghana, told us recently at a conference I attended in, in, in Addis called the African Media Leaders Forum hosted by the African Media Initiative, that there were only 31 non-state newspapers in Africa 50 years ago. They are now, I don't know, nobody has counted them, but I mean certainly they are now thousands and thousands of non-state um, newspapers in, in, in Africa. Print media is no longer a form of media that is sort of monopolistically controlled by governments in Africa. As I said, the area of broadcasting um, um, is, is, is still the area where, the, where that's the particular major problem. But I'm just trying to indicate that there has also been dramatic growth in Africa in relation to the creation of media, the numbers of media that now exist, that is in fact also a lucrative growth terrain. It's also almost a terrain in, 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 in which 
not too long from now, we're going to be able to start assessing that in some countries, media actually contribute to the economy of the country. The nation media group based in Kenya, I think, operates with lots of different media across four different countries. The STV multi-choice satellite um, platform in South Africa operates in over 50 countries of Africa, for instance. Media is actually also becoming big business in Africa, there is a much better base, but we must make sure that we're talking about independent, the growth of independent media in, in Africa. China is beginning to buy our media. And I'm wondering what people here make of it and, 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 and think of it. There's a part of me that says, goodness, if in my own country, in South Africa, the Chinese have recently helped make two big... Um, so rather important media purchases. Um, what does it matter? Um, one of these media that the Chinese have helped buy used to belong to Irish, um, to the Irish O'Reilly family. So what if it's now, if there's some Chinese money in it? What on earth is the difference really here? Isn't investment just simply investment? Or is there a real threat or a risk now that our media is going to come under a, an influence of control, of a message of control? Will there be some insidious agenda going down or not? The president of my country is inclined to say, listen, we don't like the models always of Chinese investment. They bring their workers with them instead of you know, using our workers and creating employment opportunities and so on. But money is money and investment is investment and we can take it from anywhere in the world. Why not from the Chinese? I would like to hear the views of people here today if they think this is a threat or not.